Sherry Finn sat inside of her empty bar and listened to the sound of the traffic outside. Sherry had been putting a lot of work into her business, inviting locals who maybe didn't have some place to go, reaching out to the government employees who had been her regulars before the shutdown of 2019, or should I say the first shutdown of 2019. But that shutdown was now over. All of the efforts Sherry had put into attracting groups organizing over the shutdown, groups that maybe might order a few pitchers of beer, maybe some wings, were now, for lack of a better word, all for nothing. Everyone else had moved on. Once checks started getting issued, Sherry heard from fewer and fewer of her regulars as all that money went towards paying bills, paying for groceries, repairing lives. And now Sherry couldn't even call them regulars anymore. Sherry had been awake for the better part of a week, putting every ounce of energy she had into keeping Freedom Fried alive. She had drained the last of her savings to pay the bills. She had kept the bar stocked. She had paid her employees. She had done everything she could think to do. She had even taken some of old Herbert's advice. All the same, it had been a quiet week in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Washington has been a quiet place for some time, if you believe what Ryan Lizza is writing in Esquire magazine. Every presidential administration changes Washington a little bit both intentionally and otherwise. When it comes to the city's nightlife, attitudes and standards change, especially when it comes to the sport of partisan politics. The Trump years are no different, except in the division of Democrats and Republicans. Politics have become so brutal, which isn't difficult to imagine when one party is throwing children into cages and forcing their own employees to beg for handouts, that the Democrats aren't about to party with the child kidnappers. And the Republicans aren't about to party with anyone who cares about anything other than money. We have an impasse between the old greedy white bastards and everyone else who doesn't support the Republicans. And Sherry Finn, it pains me to say, has found herself squeezed right down the middle. I can't think of anywhere worse to own a bar than a town that's mostly broke, where one side of the block hates the other. Sherry has neglected her home, her life, her nephew as well. She has missed meals. She has missed sleep. She has missed every episode of the Orville this season, and that's just a damn shame. I mean, have you been watching this? Sherry's situation is no different from any other small business owner. Maximum risk is sometimes rewarded with maximum loss. Corporations do not suffer this fate. They have kickbacks, and insurance, and lobbying groups, and lawyers. They own assets that can be converted to cash, and politicians that can be converted to votes, when they can be pressured into doing their jobs, at least. We live in a country where one side of the political aisle sees small businesses as multimillionaires with their own political action committees. They can't be bothered to consider the nearly 30 million small businesses out there 
depending on whose numbers you believe, because they're too busy being bothered by lawyers representing Coke or British Petroleum or Monsanto, which is now Bayer, which is only one major corporation lobbying Congress. Who has the time for one small business, a small bar employing less than five people, when you have to keep the number of major toxic-spilling corporate lobbyists straight? And this is why small businesses suffer, why they have for years, for decades. It's why the least of us is always imperiled, and why the minority should always be protected. Because there's too many who only care about the majority. This applies to businesses and immigrants. It applies to countries and the elderly and endangered species and each and every one of us. It certainly applies to Sherry Finn. Sherry sat inside of her empty bar holding a letter from her attorney. The bar was dark, though the sun was still shining outside, beating back the clouds of an endless winter. Sherry had poured herself a beer. Her glass sat on the table beside her, untouched. She didn't read the words in the letter. She couldn't bear to read them again. Sherry looked up at Blake's list of great perfection the great chalkboard filled with words of wisdom, once so valued by someone who was now dead. She looked at number 19, which read, Never put off until tomorrow what you can put off until next week. It was the only thing that kept Sherry from crying. Sherry probably wouldn't want you to know this. So I'm just going to have to tell you. Sherry's bar, Freedom Fried, the bar owned by her late brother-in-law, Blake, before he and Sherry's sister were both killed in the Las Vegas shooting of October 2017, the bar that had been established in 1992 by Blake's father as Freedom Fields, named after the fields that had once been a part of Georgetown. Freedom Fried was no more. Sherry had spent weeks throwing herself into the bar, throwing her life into its survival. But businesses around the country have closed thanks to Trump's shutdown. Why should Freedom Fried be any different? Americans have suffered from Trump's grifting and conniving. Why should Sherry Finn be any different? When we elect a government that cares nothing for its people, what else can we expect? And I'm sure there are people out there who think that a government shutdown couldn't possibly put someone out of business. They might also question any link between a lack of sensible gun policies in this nation, other than, yeehaw, get your gun, let's go shoot the hell out of something, and an embarrassment of avoidable debts. Or question any connection between underfunded schools and undereducated children. I know there are people who doubt that driving your car might have any effect on climate, or who believe that refugees are the same as terrorists. As if reasonable conclusions can simply be interchanged with nonsense. Trump gets in front of the American people and starts telling rhymes about how you can't have legislation with investigation and how he will build a wall to stop all the boogeymen he imagines in his tanning bed. But that nonsense has no relation to reality. 
Somehow, we Americans have decided that rejecting untruths, calling out liars, putting a stop to dangerous nonsense is the same as intolerance. As if we just have to accept it. We have to allow Fox News to keep spewing bile on a daily basis. We have to allow criminal politicians like Matt Gates from Florida to take part in a congressional hearing on gun violence and claim that immigrants are our problem and not guns. But that's not true. That's not America. We can be smarter than this. We must be smarter than this. We must reject the laziness inside of ourselves that asks us to let someone else do our thinking. We must learn to think critically and often because our pollution doesn't just magically disappear the minute it leaves our cars or our smokestacks or our landfills. It often ends up on the shores of some smaller nation that can't be heard over the din of corporations bribing larger nations. Study after study shows that immigrants are less likely to perpetrate violence and more likely to add to our nation's wealth than the lazy bastards who live here. We are killing ourselves. We don't have to look for a boogeyman, no matter how many Trump sees. Actions have consequences. Allowing a Cheeto-faced grifter to take power in the White House had consequences. Shutting down the government for more than a month, for no purpose at all, had consequences. And another shutdown appears to be right around the corner. Sherry thought she had her life in her hands. She thought the beginning of 2018 was bad. Her only remaining family was this kid she didn't understand. Her only job had turned into a great big hassle once she found out she had to run the place. But after she buried her sister and her brother-in-law, after she had changed the sign outside of the bar to something suitably ironic, a decision she now doubted and would continue to doubt for years, she thought she was ready to step into her new life. Now, she sat still, holding a letter from her lawyer. Two nights ago, she had been tending to a small crowd, making a little bit of money, congratulating herself for paying her bills and keeping the business afloat. When her landlord came in wearing a look on his face that said, well, it was an eviction kind of look, if such a thing existed. Sherry had known from taking just one look at him that her landlord was there to evict her. She tried to argue her case, and it was a strong case. She had paid her rent on time this month. She had kept out of trouble. But that wasn't enough. Because her landlord was declaring bankruptcy. And he was selling the property. Already had a buyer, too. And the entire building was being torn down. Bartender Bob told her to fight it. Sherry didn't have any fight left in her, but she did know a lawyer who had helped her with so much after her sister and brother-in-law had died. When she called, she thought her answer wouldn't come for at least a week. But her lawyer had worked faster than that, because, as she explained, Sherry could ill afford that much of a delay. 
she was going to need to be out by the end of the month. She wondered about all of the people she had spoken to who had been affected by the shutdown. Even in her still sorrow, sitting there in the bar, she couldn't imagine a government shutdown demanding such a steep price from her personally. After all, what did she do? And that's it from D.C., as with the rest of the world. Until next time, be good to yourself, be kind to others, and let's make this world a better place.